So about to start a class. Somebody asked me a question that um, about spiritual homogeneity, which you talked about. We talked about spiritual homogeneity. Uh, somebody asked me a question that she didn't really get it clear. She didn't really get it clear that she needs more clarification. So that is where we're going to start from. That's where we're going to start from today. Spiritual homogeneity. You know, one of the principles we taught we taught is spiritual homogeneity, where we said that you know beyond just marrying a believer you need to you know take it a step further marrying a believer is the standard i hope you understand that like let's say um you're going for a job interview and the qualification for the job is um bsc there's a minimum qualification bsc but if you have any other qualifications that you'll be at an advantage so out of the 15 people that came for the interview 14 of them came with BSc. But this particular guy that did that had BSc, he has done his masters and he has done his uh, professional exams. Let's say he has ICANN or something. And the guy also had um, 5 years experience in a relative um, firm or industry. Who do you think will get the job? The other 14 that just have BSc or this standard guy that didn't just have a BSc, he also had a master's, also had um, his professional exam, that is ICANN, he's a chartered accountant, he also has um, five years experience in a relative field. Who do you think will get, who do you think will get the job? Is a guy that has gone beyond the stated minimum. When we talk about um, spiritual homogeneity, the standard laid out by the scripture is that the person must be born again. We all know that. That's the standard. But that standard, just someone that's born again, is good. But for other, um, for 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 the for the compatibility to really be perfect or near perfect, there are other things we look at when we talk about spiritual homogeneity. I've talked about it before, but um, somebody didn't really get it clear. So I'll just take five minutes. I run through it. I will use a diagram which I have here to explain it further. So this is the diagram I created. So I called it the human body versus the body of Christ analogy. The human body versus the body of Christ analogy. Remember the Bible says that as Christians we are members of of the body of Christ. We are members of the body of Christ. So I'm going to use the body of the human body to explain what I mean by spiritual homogeneity. Once you get born again, once you give your life to Christ, automatically you are a member of the body of Christ. You could be the ear, the head, the hand, the leg, or some parts of the other, maybe an internal organ self. So you're a member of that body. But when we look at the body, the human body, different things accumulate cum- uh, to make that body. It started with a small cell called the spermatozoa. That's how it started. Your whole body, like you see it now, started with a small cell called spermatozoa. When that cell fused with the ova, that's the egg, the, 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 the egg of the woman, the process of forming a human being commenced in the womb of that woman. So the next thing you'll see is this diagram. So this is the cell. This is a picture of the cell. You might not see it clearly, but if you go to YouTube by tomorrow afternoon, this course will be on YouTube and a clearer picture will be inserted for you to appreciate it. But right now, I'm just trying to use the camera I'm using to live stream to show it to you. So it started with a small cell. I know a cell is microscopic. It's just a depiction of it. Then, when group of cells that have the same functions come together, they form the organ. When a group of cells that have the same function come together, they form the organ. So these are some of the organs in the human body. We have the brain, the liver, the the lungs, the kidney, etc. All there. We have them all here. Then when group of organs 
that function similarly or they come together to function a particular to carry out a particular duty important to the body they form the system they form the system so the system you're seeing right here is like you know the digestive system together with the excretory system they form a system and in that digestive system or in that excretory system we have different organs like the, you can see the stomach you can see the large intestine you can see the the small intestine in, inside there these are different organs that are supposed to carry out a particular duty on behalf of the body then there are at least 12 systems in the body at least 12. we all know about the seven popular ones but there are others like the lymphatic system there are other systems in the body when all those systems function do their different duties they ensure that the body functions well so i hope you're getting me remember the church is the body of christ so that tells me something for for god or the bible to use the body as an analogy to depict the church the universal church yes then that means we should study the body to, to to fully understand it that is why in the body of christ the universal body of christ we also have different systems in that body and inside those systems we have different organs inside those organs they are all made up of cells now see the next slide i'm going to start from the body of christ now see the body of christ we have different systems in that body of christ we can largely group them into two orthodox and unorthodox we can group them into those two categories but since we are unorthodox i'm going to take a cue from that so from the unorthodox system in the body of christ we will now have different you know under the unorthodox different variants we have the pentecostal we have the we have the reformed we have the protestant churches and several other ones there are many of them so assuming we take the protestants or the reformed church under the reformed church you have like the baptists the methodists the adventists we can go on and on and on and on the baptists the methodists the adventists and all of this are the denomination each one represents a denomination like itself we take the pentecostals in that one we have so many so many cells so many cells you can name them redeemed winners rccg elevation name them there are many under the pentecostal system so those different denominations are like the cell so see my point when i talk about spiritual homogeneity uh in the aspect of the choice of a life partner see what i mean when a man wants to marry let's say like the example i gave the life when i thought that and that should be class four if i remember clearly class four class four so go to youtube um the link to all those classes will be pasted for you to see them and make i will do that you see the link to we have five classes already that we've done class four is where we talked about spiritual homogeneity so the example we use is that if a brother from a cell of the Pentecostal movement and the name of his particular cell is XYZ Ministries, he wants to marry. What is the standard? The standard is that he marries a believer. That means he can come here, he can come here and marry anybody. That's the standard. He can come here and marry anybody. He can come here and marry anybody no problems with that because that's the standard but if he's from a cell under the pentecostal movement and he goes and marries a sister that is under a cell under the orthodox system let's say he marries a catholic remember i'm not preaching church or anything i just want to make give an example so you understand perfectly what i'm saying if he marries a catholic that is born again there's no problem with that there's no problem with that but he is from xyz power ministry 
And one of the things they emphasize in that ministry is dressing. They believe that modest dressing for a Christian should be that the sister will cover her ears with a scarf, no jewelry, no makeup, long dress, no part of her body to show. Of course, she will not perm her hair and definitely, definitely not wear makeup. And the sister that has been in the Catholic Church does all of that. She's a believer. He's a believer. Is there anything wrong in that? No, they can marry. But because of these beliefs, you will notice that their compatibility will have small, little problem. Because what he believes is not entirely what she believes. So that's what I mean. That for you to be perfectly spiritually paired, perfectly spiritually compatible, it will be better. It will be better, but it's not the standard. It's not the rule. Get my point? The rule is marry a believer. That is the standard. But it will be better, or best rather, if he comes to his own denomination, XYZ Power Ministries, and gets a sister from that system and marry. It will be best if he does that. But per adventure, he, there's no one that fancies him. He didn't find a sister there that really tickles his fancy. Fine. He can step up, step out from the cell, from the cell level, and come over to the pool, and go to other Pentecostal churches. He might leave his X Y Z prayer ministry, come here under A B C Powerhouse Incorporated International Mission Crusade Church, and pick a lady. So, if he picks a lady under here. It will be better. If he picks a lady in his particular denomination, it is best. If he picks a lady here from other pool of Pentecostals, it is better. If he now comes here under the Orthodox, remember he is unorthodox, then goes to the Orthodox system and picks a lady, good. That is good. Very good. Very good. But if he steps out of the body of Christ, And leaves the body of Christ entirely and goes outside it to marry a sister. He has left good. He has entered bad. I hope it is very clear now what I mean by spiritual homogeneity. I hope it's very clear. So that's what I that's what I, I'm tr- I'm trying to teach. That's what I'm trying to teach. So here is the surprise. That is my wife. My wife is on hand today. She's going to teach us one or two so things teach us one or two things as a follow up to some of the things we've learned and she's going to and she's going to come from a female perspective she's going to come from a female angle and she's going to talk to us about something very serious so i want you guys to listen it's great to be here um and i want to thank pastor for giving me this opportunity so i've been following everything that's been going on um following all the classes and I, I spoke with Pastor earlier today and I told him yesterday um, Pastor spoke about what to look out for in a man and what to look out for in a woman. He spoke about um, the women first and he talked about um, for the man, look out for a woman who is submissive, a woman who is teachable. And he stressed those points. And uh, for the man, he said, a man must have a head, must have a control point. A man, look out for a man who is benevolent, who is generous, who is kind. And I thought it would be great if we add to those things. One of the things pastors talked about over the last few days is about a list, a list. Because it is ineffective to pray when you don't know what you're praying for then you're praying an ineffective prayer. It is only effective if you know exactly what you are praying for. That is why it's important to have a list. You know exactly what you're looking for. You know exactly what you're asking God for. And it is critical in choosing a life partner. You have to know what you are looking for. So I'm here to help someone. I'm here to help someone. What are you looking for in a man? And I'm telling Pastor, if I have to do it all over again, with the experience I have now, if I have to do it all over again, what would I be looking for? 
What would I be looking out for in a man? What would I be looking out for? What are the things? What would be the topmost on my list? What are the things I think are very important? And I'm going to tell you. And these are the things I hope are on your list. Not just tall, dark, handsome, fair, from this place, speaks well, has this job. It is also the other things, the, the other important things. In fact, the other things that are more important, more important. First, the first thing I'm going to talk about is vision. A man who has vision. A man who understands his purpose. A man who knows who he is and who knows where he is going. This is critical in marriage. Imagine being in a car and the driver doesn't know where he's going or being on a plane and the pilot doesn't know where he's going or decides to go to a wrong destination, decides to take everybody, drive everybody into the bush. Imagine what happened to all the passengers in the plane. That's exactly how marriage is because the man is the leader. So the man is like the driver or like the pilot. If he doesn't know where he's going, guess what? Everyone is going to crash. So we're looking for a man who knows where he's going. To know where you're going, you have to know who you are first. So this man who has discovered himself. Pastors talked about it earlier. I said, know yourself. Know yourself. So a man who has discovered himself. It is only when you find yourself, you find your purpose. You know what God has sent you here to do. Then you know where you are going. And that is what that is one of the first things I'll be looking out for. A man who knows where he's going. He doesn't need to have all the money in the world. He doesn't need to have all the cars in the world. What he needs to know where he's going. Even the how, he might not know all the how, but he needs to know where. Where. If you know where, then you can start figuring out how. So that's the first thing I would be looking out for. Someone who knows who he is and someone who knows where he is. The other thing, the second thing I'm going to talk about is a man who understands his role his role in marriage unfortunately in recent times and of course this is not anyone i'm talking to it's not anyone who's watching me and it's not anyone who has been connected to us but there are people now young men who no longer understand their role or don't no longer recognize the role of a man in a marriage and some people would quote Proverbs 31. So the, the, one, the, woman, the woman would be a career woman, she would be a business woman, she would do network marketing, she will be a spiritual powerhouse, she would do everything, and then the man will out with the lads. No, that is not the role of the man in a marriage. That is not what God has specified for a man in a marriage. I want us to read very quickly, very quickly. Let us read um, Ephesians chapter 5. I know Pastor read it yesterday. To get the whole context, let's start from, from verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. I am going to read it in NIV. And I would read just verse 29. It says, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. One of the roles, or I would even say it is one of the main roles of a man in a marriage, is to provide, protect, nourish, care for his wife and his children. It is one of the roles, one of the main roles. So I would be looking for, if I were to write a list today, I would be looking for someone who understands that it is his role to provide, to protect, to nourish, to care for. I will be looking out for someone who is a leader, who has leadership qualities, who can inspire, 
who can take you to another level. Someone who is hungry for better things. Someone who is passionate about improving himself, improving everyone around him. I would be looking for such a person. Because I think it is very important. And it, unfortunately, the role of the man in society is being diminished. Is being diminished. So this is something I think we should take into consideration. It's something you should take into consideration when you are putting your list together. Amen. And then I would go on to um, the next point, which is which is which is very important. It should, it should, it's, it's way up there. I think Pastor talked about it a bit yesterday. I will be looking for a man who follows God's principles. I'll be looking for a man who is a tighter, who follows God's principles, who who takes God's word as his authority, as his final authority. A man who listens to God's word. Not just the word of the pastor. The word of the pastor is important. But a man who, who is sensitive to what God is saying. Who is sensitive to where God is taking you. Taking you as a couple. A man who is listening. A man who enjoys God's word. Who is passionate about the things of God. Who is passionate about what God is doing. I'm looking for that kind of person. A man who fears God. Who fears God. You know, Joseph. The reason, the main reason Joseph was not tempted by Potiphar's wife or refused to be tempted, he said, I cannot do this great wickedness against God. His father was not there. His brothers were not there. His mother was not there. They would never have known. They would never have heard about it. But he knew that God was watching him and he feared God. This is what would give you confidence in the days to come. This is what would help you not shake no matter where this man goes or where he is or who is around him if you know he fears god you know he wouldn't do anything to hurt god you know he wouldn't do anything to dishonor god a man who fears god and who will honor god in everything will honor you would respect you will protect your feelings it is the same principle so i would be looking out for a man who fears god Honestly fears God, not I serve his fear. Honestly, chases after God. Next thing I would be looking out for is I'll be looking to see how does this person I'm interested in, this person I think is taking me somewhere, how does he react in difficult circumstances, under stress? Because will the storms of life come in marriage? They will come, I assure you they will come. It is a given. You know, the Bible says in Isaiah 42, it says, when you pass through the waters, when you pass through the fire, they say if, he said when, because you will. The storms of life will beat. You know, the, Jesus Jesus um, talked about a parable, um, the man who built his house on a rock and his house on sand. And remember, he says, after building the house, that wasn't the issue. It was the storms the storm that hit the house, the winds that hit the house. Would there be storms? There will be storms that will hit. They will hit the marriage. They will hit the house. But what will make the house not fall is where the house is built. And what will help you in those days is a man who is rooted in the word of God, who is not shaken by calamity. I always say this thing, I'll pass. I'm yet to see, I am yet to see the situation or the circumstance or the issue. I mean, I've known him for almost 20 years. That will come up and he'll be flustered. That will come up and he'll be confused. I say, what are we going to do? Never. I've never seen it happen. Never. He's never flustered. He's never afraid. He's never worried. He's never depressed. The Bible says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Your strength is very small. And for women, we are emotional creatures. We all know we are emotional creatures. The old me, in in an in a circumstance that is not ideal, I can panic in a dramatic way, in a very dramatic way. You would be shocked. But Pastor is always calm, always positive, always pragmatic. That is. 
the kind of man you need. That is the kind of man you need. A man who is stable, no matter what, no matter the storm, no matter the circumstance. He is strong. He is solid. He is full of faith. You need that kind of man. This next thing I'm going to talk about is conflict with resolution. Plus, is probably going to have a session, a different session on conflict resolution. Because this is very important in marriage. How does he manage conflict? Some people like to avoid conflict. They don't want confrontations. I'm not saying you will quarrel and have a confrontation. But issues will come up and you will have a disagreement. You will not agree on everything. You will not. You will have a disagreement. How do you reconcile after a disagreement? How are you able to separate an issue from your relationship? People deal with disagreements in different ways. Some people would like, let's talk about it. We need to talk about it. Some others say, let's ignore it. They sweep it under the rug. Some other people, as they're having a disagreement, they're on the phone to their mom or their dad. And say, mommy, can you imagine what this woman did today? So people deal with disagreements and conflicts in different ways. There isn't a formula for, for any. But communication is key. Some people will keep malice for two weeks or for a week or will not be late for a month. Conflict resolution is, is, is very important. It's very, very important because it is in times of conflict that the devil is most active. It is at that time that he can easily attack either of you. It is at that time he can easily attack, attack any of your children. It is at that time he can easily attack your home. He can easily attack your finances. So if you don't resolve your conflicts promptly and in the right way, then there is a problem. And as a warning, if already in the courtship stage, he's calling his mom at every conflict, then that is a yellow flag. I won't say it's a red flag. I say it's a yellow flag. Some, a man who cannot make decisions unless he's spoken to his mom, that is a red flag. Who would make decisions with his mom or with his sisters and then come and inform you, that is a red flag. I'm not saying don't marry, but in the words of a cartoon character, be prepared. So, conflict resolution, I think, is very, very, very important. Hopefully, Pastor would address would address this um, in a broad sense, and would give you give us tips on what to do when you disagree, um, how easily to come together, how to reconcile to each other, um, what to do to break the ice and things like that. So you don't stay, you know, you coexist in the house and not have a relationship. They will, they will do anything to break up your relationship. will do an, every, and anything to make sure that you don't have a happy relationship. He will. And as I said, it just opens a little gate for trouble to brew. The other thing I would say about conflict resolution is that sweeping things under the carpet it will work for a, a time and then it will stop working. Ignoring problems don't make them go away. Problems need to be sorted out. They need to be worked through. If you ignore them, they would build up and build up and one person will become resentful and another person will become bitter. And before you know it, it, will, it there would be a monster growing out of somewhere and there will be a hurricane afterwards. So, it's important to know how to deal with your problem. In fact, I think I've digressed from what I've come to talk about. So I'll leave this for Pastor Tata at some, at some point. Now, the last point I'm going to make is forgiveness. Mercy, forgiveness. You're looking for someone who has a huge capacity to forgive. Someone who has a huge space in his heart who would allow you to make mistakes because you will make mistakes because you would hurt because you would you would be disobedient hopefully you shouldn't but you might be and if that happens 
You don't want him to wake up in the middle of the night and send you packing. You want someone who will forgive. So how easily, how easily do we forgive? How easily does he forgive you? Does he give you room? How easily? Forgiveness and mercy is like a bank. It's like, it's like, the more you forgive, the more you're forgiven. The more you are merciful, the more you are shown mercy. And that's exactly, exactly what Jesus says in the, in the Beatitudes. He says, blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. So, as I said, these are the few things I, I think are important, things I think you should think about, things I think you can tweak and add to your list. Amen. So, very happy to talk to all of you. And I hope you continue to have a nice time joining us on this class. Principle number 12. Family ancestry. I'll be a bit fast because I need to wrap up, wrap up the whole course very soon. Family ancestry. What do I mean by family ancestry? One of the principles of choosing a life partner is the one that you need to check where your spouse to be comes from. So it's something that we need to talk about. That is why if you are married or you must have heard that when somebody wants to get married, one of the things they do after they've done the initial introduction is that the father of either the more of the of the girl or the or the father of the groom who want to get details of where whoever is giving his daughter to or whoever his son wants to marry is from. They usually check for that details. They're like, ah, let's say the man is um, the father of the bride and this guy comes for initial introduction. You know, they will exchange pleasantries and all that. So while they are talking and getting to know each other, one of the things the father of the bride will ask this guy is, eh, where are you even from? Oh, she said, oh, okay, okay, oh, is it, okay, that local, oh, okay, that particular local government, wow, I know somebody from that local government. Okay, if what the guy is trying to do, what the father of the bride is trying to do is to get details of where this guy is from. Because once the guy leaves, one of the first things he's going to do is to send emissaries to go and investigate, find out exactly what happened, where that guy is from, especially from the guy's family. They want to know a lot of things. So when they go to do that investigation or to make those inquiries, there's a lot of things they have to find out. They want to know, are there spiritual issues in that home? Do the, do the husbands of do the husbands from that place treat their women well? If it's a reverse case, do their wives from that place stay in their husband's home or they just stay there after one, two years, they come back to their father. They just want to check trends, you know, trends. The trend in that household because once you marry into that into that household as a woman whatever happens in that household will happen in your house so we it is something critical that you must check it is a serious serious principle you must check then as one of the things that are popular actually in the web in the eastern part of the country is um, what they call slaves osu or oru you know and people are usually bothered about they want to know what is the biblical stance point regarding that it's actually simple you know christ has redeemed us from the cause of the law because he was made the cause bible says that he the hanged of the tree has handled that cause for us his cross so by jesus is dead on the cross he has handled every cause every cause so once you are born again every cause from your past has no hold again on you that is a fact that is a legal transaction Jesus did for us. Now, the question is, in reality, is that true? In reality, is that true? And you'll find out that in reality, most often than not, it is not effective. It is true, but it, are, it is not effective most times because a lot of those people that are saved have not yet learnt to appropriate the promises, the advantages of this new covenant. They've not learned it. So though they are no longer a, under a curse, though that Jesus has redeemed them from that curse, though that the blessings of Abraham is now upon them, but because they've not appropriated it the way they need to appropriate it, the benefits of the New Testament has not yet fully kicked in. I know that there are some sects that believe that once you're born again, 
If all things are passed away, true. All things are new, true. Fact, true. And they say that nothing from your past can affect you. True. But in reality, is it what really happens? No. Because there's a second leg of grace. Grace has given us all of those things. But the Bible says that it might be by faith so that it might be by grace. I think I need to show you that scripture. Because it's a really controversial subject in the body of Christ. You know, Romans chapter 4 says something. One verse, I'll read there. Verse 16. Verse 16 says something. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of all. Not just to those who are of the law, talking about the Jews, but also to us Gentiles, because we are now in that new commonwealth of faith, through the faith of Abraham. But see the key point there. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. It is clear. Totally clear. So, grace has redeemed us from the cost of the law. Grace has erased our past. All things are new. Grace has handled every consequences from what our forefathers might have done. But grace, but for grace to kick in, you must come by faith. So the appropriation of grace is when faith is enforced. How is faith enforced? When you stand on those promises, you refuse to budge. With your mouth, you declare that all things are passed away, that all things have become new. You stand on that promise and you handle every ancient ordinance, every ancient handwriting that must have been written against you. You handle it. It is something you must do. But before you handle it, you must come You must come in with repentance. You will do what we call identification and repentance. Standing on behalf of your family, your forefathers, whatever covenant, concord they might have done, agreed with whatever devil. After you've carried out re repentance and all that, and asked for everything to be reversed, you now stand in faith to enforce it. You now stand upon the sure promises of the word to enforce it. These are the things you must do. If you only say, all oh, things are passed away, all oh, things are new, and you are there quoting it, dancing up and down, doing your king's kid, nothing from the past can handle you, beautiful. But you must handle it. Confession is not enough. You must handle it. The Bible says that if the foundation, has, if something has a problem with the foundation, if there's a faulty foundation, say, what would the people do? And for us Christians, We've been given the power. This is time to step into our kingly ministry and handle whatever the enemy has done. After our priestly ministry has gone into effect, you roar like a lion now at the, at the devil after repentance and all of that has, has been done. So, confessing it is not enough, though it's good. But handling Satan and everything he has done from the past, using your forefathers, you must do it. But eventually, what my plague, you might never be from your forefathers. It might be something you yourself got into. You joined the cult, you joined one thing or the other, you got some covenant with Satan. Then you must handle it. Giving your life to Christ is, is more than enough, but that is just the legal aspect. I usually give this example when I talk about this. Now, pay attention to this example. If, if, uh, you grew up abroad after primary school, they sent you abroad, you did your secondary school abroad, you did your university, you married, you've been there 20, 30, 40 years. Then you heard that your father died. And for the first time, you're coming back home. Of course, it's going to be a bit awkward because you've not been home for a while. But after all the ceremony, everything ended, and then the, your father's lawyer had to fix an appointment for the last testament and will of your dad to be read. So all the family members gathered. And... Um, they read, they read the will, and they gave you a house. They said the house on number 14 at the Olua Street in Lekki is yours. Apparently, this house is a block of six flats. So you are happy, and you thank God. You traveled back to wherever you came from, Australia. You went back to Australia. And that house had tenants. 
You didn't even bother going back to that and even look at the house because there was no time. You need to go back because of work. And these tenants don't even know you, don't even know your dad. But somehow, after your father died, nobody came to ask them for rent. So they continue living. One year, two years, three years, four years, ten years, fifteen years. Kai, that's a miracle. No rent. Then one of the tenants, that's the oldest tenant, all of a sudden, you know, before even then, has started playing the role of caretaker, making repairs and all that. You know, other tenants now call him caretaker. And all of a sudden, after 10 years, he has not seen you, he has not seen your dad. You start feeling like he's the owner of the house. You know, you know how the thing just crept on crept up on him. It's not like you know, before long, he felt as if he's the owner of the house. You know, he might even come up one day and tell the tenant, ah, that Lord said that he who should pay rent. And because the other tenants don't know any other person, because he's the oldest tenant, they start paying rent to him. And that has been and, and, and that has created a new business for this guy. Cut a long story short. He started, collecting, he, started, he started collecting rent. He started, you know, now started like as if he's stepping into the landlord's shoes. By the tenth year, you came back home. And you're like, ah, it's true. That your dad gave you a house. Like, what's even happening with that house? You decide to go to that house. By the time you got there, of course, nobody knows you. And you are walking around, looking at the house, looking at the house. All of a sudden, people come ask, why are you? Why are you looking at the house? Say, this is my house. And they won't believe you because they don't know who you are. They've not seen you. You've not been to Nigeria apart from your dad died. And after that, the will was already disappeared. They won't believe you. They will now call of that landlord who is now who, who, actually, who, who, who is actually the caretaker in brackets. And he will come and say, who are you? You say, I'm the son of son. So this is my house. You're like, are you sure that I don't know you and all that? And this new, in quotes, landlord will want to make a case because they don't know you. Because I've lived in this house for get over 10 years without paying rent. Who would want to pack out to a house to pay rent? All of a sudden, he start making trouble. He start claiming that the house is his. And let's say this guy that came from Australia doesn't like trouble. He said, okay, no problem, no problem, no problem. I'll come back. And he leaves. These guys will not pay rent. They've not been paying rent for 10 years. The house is his. But because he has not gone to take possession of what is his, he's not enjoying the benefits. The house was given to him 10 years ago, but he has not seen one cobble, one cent, one pence of rent from the house that is his. So legally, is the house his own? Yes, legally the house is his own. But in reality, as per enjoying the benefits of a landlord, which is collecting rent, as he enjoyed it, no. So, when a Christian quotes all those scriptures, I am this, I am that, true, true, legally, it is true. Legally, that house is this guy's home. Legally, on paper, it is home. When you go to the land registry, the land belongs to him. But has he collected the rent? No, the Bible says something. The blessed be to our God, our Father, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in high places. The reality and the legality of our salvation has been given us, but it is in high places. Until you step out by faith to appropriate it, there will be no download. There will be no reality. There will be no enjoyment of the benefits of the things that are yours. That's what I'm saying. And this scripture, this scripture is, is, is in the Bible. Grace has given us all those things. But you cannot collect the fallout of grace until you step out in faith. That's one of the mistakes people are making. So when it comes to a life partner, now listen. See why it's a principle. Now, ladies, listen. You need to find out what goes on in that man's house. How would you find out? By asking questions. Get close to his sisters, his brothers. Find out what is happening for the lady, for the guy. Ask the lady, what's happening in your house? Ask questions. The period of courtship is a period of asking questions, not the period of exploring each other's body. Ask questions. Talk. Period of God is the period where you guys need to talk about everything. Then you know those that know the family. Make friends with them. Ask questions. That is how information will be got. So if you get bad or wrong information, does that mean you should leave? No. No. Once the guy is born again, remember, legally, he has been cut off from all that. Now, the second step is you need to find out. Actually, ladies, I don't want to talk to the ladies. Because you put your head into what you don't know. And you suffer the consequences. The next step now is to find out as this guy learned as he learned how to handle those things has he learned how to appropriate his grace his salvation 
Has he learned how to handle the enemy? To push Satan where he's supposed to be? If he has not learned, then that is when you need to quietly, nicely introduce him to a man you think can mentor him. Nicely. Either by talking to the mentor to approach him. That's a better option. Don't tell him, see, I want you to be friends with this guy. He'll teach you one or two things. Don't do that. Talk to the guy, the mentor. Say, see you, sir. See, see, see what I'm saying. See what, would you please help me now? Help me get close to this guy and see if you can, you know, mentor him. You know, so it won't be like he's coming from you directly. Men don't like that. So you go talk to the mentor and beg that mentor to approach the guy and make him friends and see if the guy can listen to him to learn one or two things. Very important. Very important because. When, like I said yesterday, when Satan knocks on the door of their home, will he run under the bed, spiritually speaking? Or will he go, open the door and answer the door for Satan and command him out from his house? So there are things you need to check. It is a serious principle. You need to check. It is a serious principle. And make sure that all it is in place. Like I wanted to read another scripture, but the Bible says two or three witnesses. There's another one in Timothy, but because of them I won't get there. Let me read this other one. Ephesians chapter 5. The Bible says in verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, Through whom we are, we also, he said, Through whom also we have access by faith into his grace. The doorway into grace is faith. You can never step into grace without faith. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So that tells you something. Faith. The other thing you need to find out is, is if this man that is cutting you is a man of faith. Is a man of faith. Once the man is a man of faith, more than half of your problem have been solved because a man of faith can stand handle, kick out, deal with any devil, any demon, whatever it is. Because the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. We live by faith and not by sight. The way we live our life as a Christian in the New Testament is by faith. So, find out if that man is a man of faith. Then guys, if your wife is a man, a woman of worry, anxiety, that tells you something. You need to start working on her. You start working on her. Let her know and start ingesting the word of the Lord for herself. Teach her to build her life on the word. By the time she builds in enough word on her inside, you notice all the worry, anxiety, all those things will disappear. It is very important. So it is a critical principle. It is a critical principle. Permit me to get one more principle in because if I don't, this is our course will prolong and I really really don't want it to prolong I really don't want it to prolong let me just get in one principle in it's a bit close to what we just talked about so I can get it in it's the principle of relationship with parents relationship with parents is a principle check the relationship between your spouse and his or her parents the one thing I checked when I was cutting my wife is how she relates with her parents that will tell me a whole lot. If she doesn't respect her parents, especially her father, I, I, she's not wanting for sure. She will not respect me. Because the authority figure in her life, first, is her dad. If she doesn't respect her dad, I should not expect her to respect me. There's no magic in this thing. Or vice versa. Ladies, check. Does your husband respect his parents, his father especially? If not, he will not be able to command your respect and your... Or your and your honor and your submission is very important. But one point I want to make under this principle is from both parties, especially from the woman's part. From the ladies, maybe you've had a rough relationship with your parents, with your dad or with your mom. Usually, the natural thing is that you talk against her, you you you, you talk about her without respect, you talk about him without respect. That is something that shouldn't be. Because if you talk about your dad without respect in front of your spouse, do you know what you're doing? You are automatically ensuring that your spouse, your husband-to-be, 
will not have any regard for your parents. And as a woman, you don't need that. Your husband should have small fear for your dad. Yeah, she has small fear for your dad. Why that small fear should be there because he should never ever think of maltreating you because of because of your dad. You should always portray to your spouse, your fiance, that your dad is a strong man, that your dad does not joke with you, that he does not play with you. Because if you don't do that, he will have total disrespect for your dad and your parents. So you should constantly talk about them. Hold your parents in high esteem before your fiancé. So somewhere in the back of his mind, he will know that ah, you have somebody that can come after him in case he maltreats you. Then he also on the flip side will respect your parents well. So it's very, very critical. Because any state you enter that relationship at, or that is the state everything will remain. You enter that relationship or you enter that marriage disrespecting your parents, your spouse will not respect your parents. That is the truth. So make sure you enter that relationship with utmost respect for your parents. And you also talk about them like that before your spouse. So he will naturally and automatically respect them. So it's very, very critical. The next one I'm going to talk about is compatibility. I'll just introduce it. Tomorrow we'll look at all the levels of compatibility. There are different facets of compatibility. So one of the things you also need to check is how compatible you guys are. As I round up now. How compatible you guys are. Intellectually, are you guys compatible? Socially, are you guys compatible? Really spiritually, are you guys compatible? We've talked about that, so we won't talk, we won't talk about that. Are your jobs compatible because of the kids that are coming? Emotionally, are you guys compatible? Recreationally, are you guys compatible? And many other indices of compatibility. We are going to talk about that tomorrow. So please.